All right. So thank you all for being here. Our last of this uh, of this series. It's been a lot of fun, and I appreciate all those who have made it uh, to any part of it or to all of it. Um, sorry, I'm just uh, also admitting people who are coming into the waiting room. Um, so Rabbi Yaakov is uh, is is uh, not feeling 100. percent So we're just gonna go for it ourselves um, and uh, and wish him a refuah shlema. So without further ado, today is our, our last of the five uh, of the five part series. Um, excited to be at this, uh, this end and also sad to be finishing up with all of you. Um, so we're just going to kind of recap really quickly what we've been learning about. And then I want to try and bring it all together in today's class. So first for a, a quick recap. So in the first class, we spoke about the concept of an open secret. Right, this idea that there's two ways to have a secret. There's a secret which is kept secret because this is something knowable, something you could know, but if I don't share it with you, if I keep it hidden, if I keep it secretive, so now it remains a secret. And then there's a second type of secret, which is something that as much as I will reveal to you, you will still not know it because it's something that's, that is utterly in its definition and it's in its fundamental character. It's something that's unknowable. And so we spoke about that in the history of in the history of Yiddishkeit, in the history of Judaism, there's really been two approaches to understanding this, this concept of the secrets of Torah. One approach is that there are these secrets which we're supposed to keep hidden. We're not supposed to share the, the information or the content. But there's another approach, which I believe is the approach of Hasidus, which says the nature of this secret, when we call this, this the secrets of Torah, the Sisrei Torah, it doesn't mean that it's meant to be something that we don't share. What it means is that in its very nature, it is a secret. And what that means is that no matter how much about it we share, it will still remain a secret to you. It's, it is unknowable on some level. It's something we can send, something we can experience, something we can talk about, we can talk around, but we can never fully grasp it. Sorry, I'm just hearing some background noise, so I'm just wanting to make sure that everyone's muted. Here we go. Okay. I think I just got everyone muted. Okay. So that was the, the, the first concept we spoke about as a introduction, as kind of a framework for all these concepts that we're going to, that we've been learning about the past few weeks in which we're talking about the secrets of Torah. We're talking about things which on the, on one level we can talk about, but on another level, we can't fully understand. And the idea is that we're trying to, in a sense, whet our appetite. We're trying to create this consciousness of, of, of longing, of curiosity, of searching, because that searching itself already is the whole point, because God is something that we're searching for. And that search already is in, in large part, the, the finding. So with that framework, we then began to try and look a little bit more closely at how to understand creation through the lens of Hasidus, through the lens of, of spirituality. And so the very first idea that is taught to us is this idea of symptom, this idea of concealment that in order for Hashem to create the world, Hashem decided first to conceal himself. So we try to understand this a little bit more deeply because concealment or creating space for the world is not a matter of physical space because there is no physicality. God's not physical. So what does it mean that there wasn't space for the world? So what we explained is that what it means is that there wasn't space, meaning there wasn't the possibility of any sort of independent consciousness any independent identity. Nothing could experience itself as a separate entity from God. If God was to simply just emanate himself forward, all that would result in is more God, it, more godliness. It wouldn't, it wouldn't result in any independent beings. And for whatever reasons, God wanted us to have a world in which we experience ourselves on one level as independent of him. That creates the possibility for free will, for choice, for Bechira. And so what did Hashem do in order to create that possibility for independent entities, independent identities, for consciousness of separateness? He began by distilling from within himself different qualities. Within his oneness is contained everything. It's just oneness. But Hashem distilled that oneness into separate, separate qualities. The very first quality that got distilled out of his oneness is his most essential qualities.
quality, which is the total and absolute unknowability of Hashem, the total uniqueness, singularity, otherness of God, the transcendence of Hashem. By distilling out that quality, now God appears to be absent, appears to be removed, because that quality, when it is revealed, the revelation of transcendence appears to be concealment because that's what transcendence is. It's I'm not here. I'm above this. I'm not here. So if I reveal my transcendence, then the experience of that is a lack of Hashem. So the concealment is actually not really a concealment. It's a revelation, but it's a revelation specifically of Hashem's total transcendence and unknowability. And when that is revealed, what emerges is the experience or the seeming reality of a lack of God, of a concealment of Hashem. And that's what Kabbalah, that's what Hasidus understands as Tzimtzum. Hashem constricted himself by revealing his otherness. He is now seemingly not there. We then looked at the next step. Hashem now uses that as a filter, as a darkening shade to then distill out other qualities his other qualities, which are present, which are revealable, which are able to be experienced and sensed. And he reveals, he emanates those qualities of loving kindness, of wisdom, of discernment, of intimacy, of courage, of royalty, of honor, of fear, of love, all these different qualities that he distills from within, within his oneness. He emanates and reveals those through the darkening shade, through the quality of his total transcendence. So now we arrive at a world in which we have this mixture, this balance, or this back and forth, this mati velo mati, reaching and not reaching, this chios ratzo v'shov, right, the going and coming, because now we have the emanated qualities of God, the knowable qualities of God, but they're kind of tamp, tamped down, they're moderated, they're balanced, they're filtered through the darkening shade of the light of darkness. So the light of light is being revealed through the light of darkness. The revelation of presence is being filtered through the revelation of lack. And so then we arrive at a world in which the world then through that process appears to us as a world in which on the one hand, we experience God immensely present. And at the same time, we experience a world in which we feel completely independent. We have free will. There's multiplicity. It's not just a world of oneness. And we feel at times that there's a lack of God. And from that, we understood that really everything in this world, it's not the way that so often people understand or think about it as we have this world, which is this kind of vessel. And then in this world comes Ruchnius. In this Gashmi world comes Ruchnius. In the physical material world comes spirituality. Rather, what it is, is that the physical world is spiritual. It's a physical world of, it's a physical version of spirituality because it's all on this continuum. When the revealed qualities of Hashem are emanated through this filter, this darkening filter, what comes out on the other side is a physical world. But that physical world is just the end of the spectrum, the end of the continuum of these emanating qualities of God's, of God's spirituality, of godliness. And so then last week, what we looked at is, okay, now let's look from within our experience, within our existence, how do we climb back up that ladder? All of that is how, the, how it comes down the ladder. But how do we climb back up the ladder? And so we looked last week at Rav Cook's prescription, along with Rav Levi Yitzchok's prescription, of how we climb back up the ladder. And the way that we do that is specifically through this world, through seeing this world as the corridor, that enters the prose door that enters into the Traklin, right? The, the, the gateway into the palace. And then we have to be working through this sensory world, through this physical world, because this world actually is the only way into God, because God, just as God, Hashem as Hashem, is completely transcendent, as we explained, completely unknowable. And so the only way that we can actually reach Hashem is through the physical world, because again, the physical world is not physical. It is physical, but it's a physical version of spirituality. And that's how Hashem has made himself knowable and accessible to us. And so we spoke last week a lot about these different mashalim of the gift, the giving of a gift and appreciating the gift to then be able to get to the relationship with the gift giver. 
And we spoke about how you climb that ladder. Specifically, a person who's more spiritual will eat more slowly, will appreciate the taste of the food more. A person who's more physical will appreciate the beauty in the world even more. The spiritual, the spiritual seeker, in your Cook's understanding, the spiritual seeker is entrenched in this physical world because he understands that the physical world is the portal to spirituality because the physical is just the end of the continuum of how the spirituality is manifest into a way that we can actually access. Okay, so all that is kind of a brief synopsis of where we've, where we've uh, journeyed in these past four weeks. And so what I wanna do today is try and bring it all together in uh, kind of from a different angle. Because what emerges from everything we've been learning really, if you boil it all down, is the concept that we've all heard, but that I hope we can appreciate a little bit more deeply now, which is the concept of Enod Milvado, that there is nothing besides Hashem. And sometimes that's been understood to say there's no other gods besides Hashem. Sometimes it's been understood to say there's no other powers besides Hashem. Sometimes it's been understood to say there's nothing else that's worth caring about, but, you know, serving or worshiping besides Hashem. But according to Hasidos and according to the way that we've, under, we've been developing, and now we can hopefully understand with more depth, Enol Milvado means Enol Milvado Mamish. There's nothing besides Hashem. Because everything is part of that continuum. Everything is part of that process. It's not just that everything is influenced by that process, but everything literally comes into being from that process of God's emanating qualities, from that distillment into different qualities, and then the emanations of those qualities through the filtering. That's literally how this came to be. It's not just that you and I are here and those things are coming into our lives. We're, we are here as part of that continuum, of part of, as part of that process. Literally, the fact that I'm speaking to you, the fact that there's different words that I'm saying, there's different sounds that I'm making, the fact that we're looking at each other, that we're in different places, that it's a specific time of the day, a specific day of the week, a specific week of the month, a month of the year, a year of, of history. All these things, the fact that we, the, there's this computer and there's this button to press, all these things it's not just that they are vessels to receive that process. They are the end of the line of that conveyor belt, of that process. They are the manifestation of that original, original beginning of distilling God's, God's different qualities into different parts and then emanating them through that process that we've been learning about. So it's literally Enod Movado because every single thing we've been talking about is another form of Hashem's light. So Enon Milvado doesn't mean that it's all one in the sense that it all dissolves in a way that the particularity of things is lost. Someone might approach spirituality, a spiritual way of living, and think that, well, if it's all God, then it doesn't matter that this is white and this is blue, or that this tastes sweet and this tastes spicy, or that this person is, is this character and this person has a different characteristic, because it all dissolves into Eno Milvado. It all dissolves into oneness. But according to what we've been learning about, it's the opposite. Eno Milvado means it's all godliness. Literally, it's all godliness, but not by dissolving the particularity of things, but by enriching the particularity of things, by appreciating the particularity even more, the specificity of things. The more that I appreciate each specific thing, each specific person, each specific experience of a person, each specific taste of a food, each specific blade of grass that you look at, each specific breath you take is, another manif is, is a particular manifestation of godliness through that process. And it's all godliness. It's all light. Everything is light. But there are so many different colors of light. And that first original light is a light of darkness. That's the symptom. So everything is godliness in a variety of forms. And we only get to access and appreciate and have a relationship with Hashem more and more as we appreciate the particularity, the specificity, the individual qualities of each person, of each 
experience we have of each thing that exists in this world, because that's another end of the continuum, another manifestation of godliness through this process. But it's all Hashem. Or as Rabbi Nachman talks about something we're going to look at later from Tehillim in Parakuf Lamites. Rabbi Nachman talks about this in Lakutim Moran to Sucheni Bebeten Imi. Right, that I should be, I should be enclosed, I should be enwrapped, enveloped, tisucheni. Rabbi Nachman talks about this in the context of sukkah, because a sukkah is tisucheni. I'm, I'm enveloped, bebeten imi, in the womb of my mother. This world is an experience of being within the womb of God, in the belly of God. Because as the Medrash says, ein ha'olam mikomo. <clears throat> the world is not God's place. Rather, God is the place of the world. And this is really important because it really shifts the imagery that we use, <clears throat> excuse me, the imagery we use to understand the relationship between Hashem and the world. Very often, a person thinks about Hashem in the world as, here's the world. So we have this, this sphere, this circle, whatever it is, this dot on a piece of paper. If you would ask someone to draw, where is the world and where is God, right? So you have this piece of, you have this dot, and then God is above the world. That's the classic imagery, right? And then for somebody who believes in divine providence, someone who believes that Hashem is, is a kel chai, is a living God, is, is in the world. So the way that they'll understand that is that from that, that Hashem, that God that's outside the world, will enter into the world. And somebody who has even more spiritual perspective will understand that Hashem is, 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 is emanating brachos and shefa and, and chios into this world constantly, but still from without. So you have the world and you have God outside the world entering in in a variety of ways. But what the Medrash is teaching us and what this Pasuk and Tehillim that Rabbi Nachman draws upon is teaching us is that it's actually, that's not the way it is. The Medrash says the world is not God's place. It's not that, it's not that Hashem is coming into the world. God is the place of the world. So what that means is that we actually have to reverse the imagery. It's not that we have this world, this dot, this circle, and then God is outside of it. It's if you would, if you would take a piece of paper and try and draw the accurate imagery, the way that it, you would draw it is the piece of paper is God. This, uh, this, this white piece of paper, this just pure, that's God. Now draw a circle on the piece of paper. That's the world. The world is within Hashem. Hashem distills from within his oneness, these different qualities that creates this space for, the, for there to be an experience of godliness that is still not so intensely godly that we experience it as being from outside of God, but it's within God. So it, it's, such a, it's such an important paradigm shift. It's all within. It's all within. Everything's within. Hashem is not outside. Hashem is within us. Excuse me, the opposite. We are within Hashem. Hashem's not even within us. We are within Hashem. We are on the inside. And here's what this means for me. And this is kind of what, the way I want to bring everything we've been learning about together into a bit of a more two feet on the ground practical way. Because there's been a lot of concepts, a lot of kind of more conceptual ideas being shared. But the way that this all comes together for me in a very practical way is that, you know, people often ask, what's Hasidus, right? Like what? What makes chasidus chasidus? What makes something else, you know, what, what makes different things what they are? And it's a very difficult question to answer. Actually, Rav uh, Wolfson, in the beginning of one of his svarim, he writes that he has no idea. Someone asked him that, and he, sa he says, I, I don't think I can define it, you know? I, I can't really define it. The Lubavitcher Rebbe, of course, has his famous Kuntros uh, in Yonah Shel Torah Chasidus, very fascinating mahalach, where his whole, his, his essay is dedicated to explaining what is chasidus, what makes it unique. But it's a difficult question to answer. And the truth is so often when you, when you, if you give an answer, it, uh, it, you can question it because you could say, well, that's not really Hasidus, that's Torah, <laughs> right? Like you could find that earlier in, in Torah sources. And, and that's actually okay. That's actually a good thing, right? Because the idea is that, that Hasidus isn't necessarily revealing something entirely new. 
And I don't think any of the, the, the true Kedusha, MS, Misora driven um, movements within Yiddishkeit that have emerged are ever really revolution, revolutionizing something entirely new. But what they're doing is they're, they're different groups or different movements emphasize different parts of Yiddishkeit. So it's like if you have all the pieces, you have all the, the elements are the same because Yiddishkeit in its original sources are so vast and so open and, and, and endlessly, there's just endless room for how to understand and how to, how to, how to uh, bring it to life, really. So one person could emphasize a certain group of a certain part of that original original sources of the, the raw material. You can emphasize a certain certain elements of the raw material and it'll come out in one form. You can then emphasize a different group, a different theme within the original raw material and come out with a different, a different kind of you know form. And so different movements within Yiddishkeit have emphasized different raw elements from within the original ingredients and come out with different forms. So Hasidus emphasizes a particular set uh, of sources, a particular set of ingredients from within the original raw material. The Musser movement emphasized, the Musser movement didn't make up new sources. The Musser movement also emphasized a certain set of, of ingredients from the original raw material, right? The more, the more, the, the brisker mahalach or the more, you know, litvish, uh, yeshivish mahalach also didn't make something up but they, they emphasize the different set of ingredients from within the raw material. And the same is true for Hasidus. But here's what Hasidus emphasized within that, the raw material, within the ingredients of the raw material that for me makes it so unique and is the reason that, that really just for me, that, the, what it captured. Uh, so it, it, first of all, for me, it just seems to be the most sophisticated and intellectually resonating um, form of, of Yiddishkeit. Like for me, it just, it, it, it intellectually, philosophically, theologically, it's, it's, it feels so much more profound and so, and so real and so true in, in such a deep and intellectually prof sophisticated way. Uh, but, but really on a life way in, in, in life in lived life, what, what Hasidus emphasized and the reason that it captured me so much is because I think that for so many of the places that I was prior to really getting more entrenched and involved in Hasidus, it kind of felt like the way that Yiddishkeit is lived is the following. There's a path, and on this path is Kedusha. On this path is Ruchnius, is, is HaKadosh Baruch Hu, is Torah and Mitzvos. And then we have moments in our lives where we're off the path. So there's this narrow path. It's relatively narrow. It's mostly a Gemara um, and a Mishnah Bura, um, but you know, some other things too, um, but it's this narrow path and it's very, very straight. It's a very straight path. And our Avoda as a, as a, as a, uh, as a, as a from Jew is to be on this path as much as possible. And sometimes, though, we can't be on the path or sometimes we make mistakes and we're not on the path. And those are glitches in the system. So there's three ways, I think, in, in, in not being on the path. Either it's a glitch because we messed up, we sinned, we did something wrong and we fell off the path. And now we have to get back on the path. Or number two is a little bit more of an elevated version of this, which is that there are things in our lives that are that are necessary for us to do that are not really on the path. OK, you have to go grocery shopping, right? You have to go to work. So for some people, if you can't be in, you know, if you can't be in learning full time, so then, okay, you have to go off the path, right? And, and it's mutter, it's not bad. It's just, it's, it's just kind of par, it's, it's bland, it's neutral, right? So you're off the path and then you want to get back on the path as much as you can. Or there's a third option, which the Rambam talks about and others talk about, which is we can elevate it even more, which is we can see all the moments off the path as being ways of enhancing your experience on the path. So when you're shopping, when you're eating, when you're sleeping, et cetera, these are ways, they're means towards an ends, but still the, there are means towards an ends of being back on that path. So it's really all about this kind of narrow path that's very, very straight. And then there are three different ways in which we are off the path and we want to get back on. And at least for me, I don't, I don't want to say that that's the case for other people, but that, that's what so much of my, my experience felt like. And Hasidus brought a whole nother perspective to that. 
based on everything we've been learning about for the past four classes, what I hope you can understand in not just kind of like a feel good way, but you can understand there's a deep, deep philosophy behind this is that Hasidus says that that whole image of the path is wrong because life is not a narrow straight path. Kedusha is not on a narrow straight path. God is not found on a narrow straight path with moments of being off the path and needing to get back on. Everything in this world is within to Sucheni Bivetanimi. The entire existence of the world is the end of that continuum, the end of that con- conveyor belt, the end of that process of revelation and concealment and revelation through the concealment and everything we've been learning about, meaning it's all light. It's all godliness. So what that means is that everything is the path. The path is not narrow and the path is not straight with moments of deviations and glitches and getting off the path. Rather, the path is extremely windy and very wide because everything is another form of encountering God. It's not that you encounter God only in a specific, yes, let's be clear, right? Um, This goes without saying, one of the very, very important ways of encountering God is a Gemara. So I'm not taking that off the path. Of course, that's still on the path, right? But the point is this, it's not that a Gemara is the only way to encounter God and a Gemara is the path and that everything else is just means towards that ends. Rather, everything is on the path because God's oneness is distilled into a variety of parts that are emanated into a, into a process that manifests as this sensory physical world that we experience. So there are so many different forms of how light comes into, the, into existence, how light comes into this world. There's moments in which we don't experience godliness at all, but that's also on the path. Why? Because as we learned about, the moments of not experiencing godliness are actually the light of darkness. They're the revelation of God's, of God's lack, of God's transcendence. So even the moments where you totally don't feel God, that too is part of the path because it's actually a light of Hashem being revealed in a way that is not experienceable in any way other than not experiencing God, but that's part of the path, right? Eating is part of the path. It's, it's the taste of the food is the emanation, the, uh, is, is the physical version of that emanation, right? Um, everything that we experienced can be an experience of, uh, even, even the moments that we've fallen, the moments that we've fallen uh, are the Sheva Yipol Tzaddik moments, right? The moments that through that we end up growing closer, right? Going to work, the, the Balatanya talks about in Parshas Noach and Torah Or, right? Is, is the Mayim Rabim, Shalo Yuchlu Lichabos It's, the, it's the, the waves crashing down on us that just make us want to long for, for even more, right? Being in the farthest places are the Aye moments that Rabbi Nachman talks about. The Baal Shem Tov talks, and obviously all these things require their, their, their own, you know, shear to go into more deeply, but, but the Baal Shem Tov talks about even taivos for, for things that we shouldn't uh, actually, you know, actualize or things we shouldn't have a taiva for. Even those things are, are, are actually part of the light. Those are, those are taivos, those are desires uh, for avos the fulos, they're fallen loves, the Baal Shem Tov talks about in, in, in many places. So, so the light is manifest, and therefore the path includes includes everything. It includes eating, walking, talking to people, marriage, music, art, nature. They're all part of the path. They're all on the path. It's very windy and it's very broad. Even being angry with God is a chutzpah de kedusha, right? If we, if, we, if, if we know how to elevate it, if we know how to transform it. Even having spekos in, in, in amuna is, is, is part of the light of Hashem's transcendence. Even having taivos rose, our avos nefulos. And so the point here really is again this idea of enon movado, tesucheni bevetan imi, that it's not that there's this path we need to be on and then there's glitches that take us off the path, but rather it's that this path is windy and it's wide and it's all light. Everything is light. 
Of course, there's a big difference between prior to choice and after choice, right? So Yaakov alluded to that at once in, in, in one of the shirim afterwards, right? We have to be careful in, in knowing about not, not taking this to mean that we can choose anything we want to do and say, well, then it's light, you know, it's because it's all light. It's all part of the path. That's not the upshot of this, right? We have, we have, we have halacha means hakli. Halacha is, it's the vessel. It teaches us how to, how to, how to access the light and halacha means to walk. And it actually literally means the path. It teaches us how to, how to walk this path. So we have guidelines, we have structure, we have, we have, uh, we have, um, you know, a uh, road, po- you know, uh, it's like, it's like, if you go on a, a, you know, a hike or something, right. If you're like on the blue trail or the green trail, there'll be like signs on the trees, right. Like the little blue to know if you're on the right path or not. Right. So, so we're given signs to know, you know, where to walk. But then afterwards, when we look back, if we already, if we already made a mistake, if we already messed up, so we know that Shuva can become, uh, you know, Zdonos Naso Zechuyos, even our greatest fallings can become merits, which means that they too become part of the path. And so, my hope is that from this series, what you can walk away with is an approach to your life that sees all of it as being part of this very windy and very broad path. But to understand that that's not just a little feel-good idea, right? So <laughs> what I mean by that is that, you know, people like to talk about Hasidus nowadays as being what they call neo Hasidus, Right? So I always like to say there's something called neo hisnagdus. <laughs> so what I think neo hisnagdus is is the following. I think it's actually a really important co- concept for people to know. <laughs> so what I think it is is the following. So thank God nowadays, very very few people are still holding by the original fight between the Hasidim and the Misnagdim. Very few people think that uh, you know. Misnagdim are, are all, you know, it's all bad, you know, chas v'shalom, or that the chasidim, it's kfira, and it's all bad, chas v'shalom, right? So very few people are holding in this place of, like, you know, posseling the other side, right? And, and none of us should be, right, for whichever direction we're talking about. So that kind of like division of like black and white, right? Like this, like very polarized division is over pretty much. So very few people are gonna, are gonna say that Hasidus is bad, you know, or it's wrong. You know, it's, 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 it's treif, it's, you know, it's in cheyrem, it's, it's, you know, it, you, sh- you can't do that. It's very, very rare. So, in, so, but what you do find, which is what I call neo hisnagdus, because the original hisnagdus is pretty much over. But the neo hisnagdus is that people have this narrative about Hasidus that Hasidus started for the people who were unlearned and broken and very, very kind of low in society and almost like the, 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 the unsophisticated, incapable, intellectually incapable kinds of people. And actually, the truth is that that narrative about Hasidus at one point was historically thought to be true. But it's interesting if you if you look in like academic circles and like history, his, you know, academic historians, that is actually completely rejected nowadays. That whole narrative about Hasidus is actually not true. Um, there's an element of truth to it, meaning there was an element in which what Hasidus brought gave a lot of life to people who were very kind of broken and and even the and even the simpletons. Of course, there's a lot of truth to that. But it's not true that that's like what Hasidus was for or where it originally started. It was, it was something that caught on fire for, for, for lots and lots of people, for Tamidei Chachamim, for very learned people, for well-to-do people. It's, it's just not true, historically speaking, it's not true that it was this kind of like, oh, all the, you know, all the well-to-do and learned people were the misnagdim and all like the, the broken, like, idiot accurate that at one point that was thought to be true, but it's actually not historically accurate. Um, but the reason that, but besides for the history, the reason that this is so important is because the way that it's spoken about now in kind of contemporarily is that even the most Litvish yeshivas now will have a tish or will, will, will have a Thursday night Hasidos with Chalant, right? Or we'll have, you know, um, some, something that they'll, they'll quote a Hasidish Amaisa, Right. Or, you know, they'll, they'll use the quote unquote inspiration, the feel good stuff of Hasidus. 
And so neo hisnagdus is the approach to say that Hasidus isn't bad, but it's, it's a helpful thing for people who need it. It's something that, that, you know, for people who can't cut it in learning three star a day of Gemara, so it's good, for, you know, so yeah, learn, learn a Kedushas Levi, learn a Nesiva Shalom, right? Go to a Tish, right? That those are good things. Daven, you know, work on your davening more. And, you know, um, the, you know, these are good things, right? These, these are things that you can connect to and they can be really helpful for people who, who need it. You know, the people who can't, who can't get their Sipa Kanefesh from the quote unquote mainstream, you know, bread and butter, meat and potatoes of what Yiddish kites really about, right? If the, if the, if the meat and potatoes isn't good enough, is, isn't enough for you because maybe you have ADD, maybe you have some, some childhood stuff, you know, issues, maybe you have, whatever it is, you have more of a, a, you're a person who, 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 who just more. And then even for the guys who are the top notch guys. Okay. So it's good for them. And you know, and I've been as to go to a Kumsitz, right? So we're not postling Hasidus, but it's seen as this kind of feel good help with the inspiration, fluffy kind of a thing, right? That's neo in my, in my view. Now, the reason that that's so off is because it's, I mean, it's just not true, right? Uh, <laughs> that's why I guess it's, the reason it's not true is because it's not true. <laughs> um, but, but meaning, the, the, the point is that, that the reason it's not true is because Hasidus is a, is, is a, I'm not saying it's the only lechatchila. It's not, but it's, it's a lechatchila. It's not a crutch. It's something that is, a, is an optimal way of avodah Hashem. And it actually includes everything else that any other movement advocates for. It's not exclusive to anything. Right? Of course, a chassid is makbed on halacha. And of course, a, a chassid learns gemara and learns halacha and, and all the, and, and, and everything. I mean, it, these things go without saying. It's, it's almost like silly to say. So it includes everything and it adds to it. And, and based on what we've been learning about, so this is my hope, is that the approach that we took to understanding this by starting in the beginning, by starting with understanding how this world came to be, you can see that there's a a real depth of sophistication behind the ideas of Hasidus. The reason that Hasidus is, is more open to finding God even outside the base medrash is not just because, oh, I'm sorry, you can't cut it as a base medrash guy. It's because there's a deep understanding of how Hashem is manifest into this world in a way that to truly access Hashem, he's accessed in a multiplicity of ways. And he's, he's accessed through this world. And it's not just, oh, if you can't cut it or because I want to help you feel good about yourself that we say when you messed up or if something happened or whatever it is that you should keep going right there and you should pick yourself up. No, it's because there's an understanding of, of what, this, what the DNA of this world is, what the building blocks of this world are. How Hashem is manifest into this world within the world of Hasidus is incredibly complex. We just, we just barely even scratched the surface of understanding the depth behind it. But it's founded not on a, on, a, on a philosophy of helping people feel good, which is also fine, but it's not founded on a, on a, on a, on a, on a hollow foundation. The foundation of these concepts of these ideas are rooted in some really dense and complex and sophisticated and thorough, deeply thoughtful understandings of the relationship between God and the world. Essentially, any religious movement of any religion is trying to figure out how do we understand this thing called the world and how do we understand this thing called God? And there are many, many ways to approach that. And Hasidus has a really unique approach to that. And all the, the, the maisalach and the, the vorts and all of those kind of little nuggets of things are really rooted in this very deep foundation of understanding that question of what's the relationship between God and the world. 
And, uh, and you know, I just think this is an important point uh, for, for those of us who are venturing into these waters to understand and to think about and to have that perspective. And, you know, this is really what the Baal Shem Tov talked about when he said, uh, you know, he, he emphasized, I mean, it's not the Baal Shem Tov, it's David Melach, but again, uh, the different movements emphasize different ingredients from the original raw materials. And what the Baal Shem Tov emphasized from the original raw material was Shivisi Hashem Lenegdi Samid, that Hashem is always in front of me, which means that in whatever it is I'm looking at, it's not that Hashem is always in front of me, that when I'm looking and talking to another person, my mind is really on Hashem. It's a very important clarification. Shivisi Hashem Lenegdi Samid doesn't mean I'm talking to you, but in my mind, I'm thinking about Hashem. It means I'm talking to you and that's how my mind is on Hashem. It doesn't mean that when I'm eating, okay, I'm eating, but my mind is really, it's through the food that my mind is on Hashem. And it means that when I'm learning Gemara, I'm, I'm encountering Hashem. And when I'm learning Chumash, I'm encountering Hashem. And when I'm taking a walk, I'm encountering Hashem. And when, when, when I'm going to work, I'm encountering Hashem. And as the Baal Shem Tov says, even when Hashem is Lenegdi, even when Hashem appears to be against me, the moments where I don't feel close to Hashem, even the Lenegdi moments are Shivisi Hashem. It's all Shava. It's all, it's all part of Hashem's oneness. This is also the teaching of the Baal Shem Tov in, in uh, Keser Shem Tov. In uh, Os Lamed Tes. There's a beautiful teaching that uh, I actually first got into, into a, lot, a lot of these ideas in a, uh, in a university course on, on the Baal Shem Tov <laughs> in, in college. And uh, this was one of the first pieces that the professor taught was this piece in Keser Shem Tov, Lamed Tes. Fascinating. Actually, actually a great guy. It's very good stuff. Professor Jonathan Dauber. So he taught this piece from the Kesser Shem Tov. That the Gemara in, uh, in Brachos says that a person who says Shema, Shema, Mishaskinoso, that if a person says Shema twice, if a person uh, says, you know, Shema Yisar, Shema Elkino, Shema Echad, uh, two times, and why would they be saying it two times? So supposedly it's, it's seemingly it's a case where a person is not sure that they had Kavana the first time, so they want to say it again. Right, so the Mish, the Gemara says that we quiet him. We don't let him do that. Why? Because we don't want it to appear as if there's two gods. So I'm saying Shema Yisrael Shemel Kenu Shem Echad, and then Shema Yisrael Shemel Kenu Shem Echad might seem like there's two gods. So we quiet him down because it shouldn't appear that way. So meaning he sh- mean, quiet him down, meaning don't do that. That's what that's what the Gemara is saying. You, you're not allowed to do that, even if you think you might not have a kavana the first time. You're not allowed to say Shema Hashem, uh, uh, again. So the Baal Shem Tov says in Kesher Shem Tov, he's quoted as saying. What does this mean? You might make it seem like there are two gods. Because if you say it again, what you're essentially saying is that my first experience of saying Shema Yisrael Hashem Elkeno Hashem Echad wasn't, wasn't meant to be by God. That's why I have to say it again. So what the Baal Shem Tov says is the reason you can't say it again is because whatever level of Kavana you had, even if it was that you didn't have Kavana, even if it was that it wasn't perfect, Whatever it was in that moment is exactly what it was meant to be. Again, if you're standing prior to the action, you're supposed to think about having as much covenant as you possibly can. But once it's over and you're looking back on it, it was what it was. And what it was is, exa- is, is part of the path. It's not off the path. It's part of this winding and wide path. And so it was exactly what it was. And so if you believe Hashem Echad, that there's actually only one God, then everything that exists is within the belly of God. It's within the womb. It's within Tusukhini Bevet Animi. It's all light. So you can't go back and say, well, now I need to say it again. Because if you truly believe in Eno Movado, then everything is within that. Everything's part of that. And then ultimately, this really is the teaching. We'd be remiss not to, not to use this in this context. This is really the teaching of, of, of the Baal Shem Tov in his mashal about the walls, right? So the most famous teaching of the Baal Shem Tov. This also, by the way, is from that class that I took, but uh, then saw it in many contexts later. So the, the, the Baal Shem Tov is quoted in Degel Machna Ephraim in many places, but it's in Kesar Shem Tov as well, in Os Nun Aleph. As, and this is, this is a mashal that needs its own series because there's so many elements and details to this mashal. But I'm just going to focus on one aspect of it. The Baal Shem Tov gives this mashal, he says, this, he, supposedly he gave this over before Tekiah's Shofar. And he said that, imagine a, a king who decides that he wants to play a little game with the people of his, uh, of his, uh, that he governs. So he sets up using magicians and special 
uh, special abilities that he has, he sets up a kind of like a, a maze of walls around his palace. So kind of in concentric circles, walls that exist around his palace. And at each wall, at each different part, each level of the, of the, of the maze, he puts different, very amazing material goods. So maybe it's money or maybe it's, you know, royal garments or delicacies or whatever it is. And he puts different things at each different level of the maze with growing, growing significance. So in the first level, it's like, you know, whatever it is, it's a hundred dollars. I'm making something up at the next level. It's, you know, a hundred thousand and then it's a million and then you get closer and closer talking about, you know, major, major wealth. And he invites everybody to enter the, the maze and see how, how close they can get to him. He tells, he, he announces to the city, everyone can, can come meet with me, the king, which is a huge opportunity. Who would want to meet with the king, the beloved king, the royal king? But they don't know that there's going to be these, these you know, little bits of wealth along the way in the maze. He says, if you can get through the maze, you can come meet me. And so everybody enters and they start trying to find their way through the maze and as they go through the maze, most people find the hundred dollars like, well, all right, I'll take the hundred dollars. But they're told that if they take the hundred dollars, they can't keep going. So they take the hundred dollars, they go home. Then a group of people is like, no, I, I really want to meet the king. So they keep going and they get to the next level of the maze. But now there's a hundred thousand dollars. So most of them take the hundred thousand dollars and they go home. But a few people keep going and then they, get, they finally get to the next level of the maze and that is a million dollars. So no one's passing that up. So they take the million dollars and they go home and they're happy. They're excited. You know what? This is a great day. Just got a million dollars. There's one person who keeps going. He doesn't take the million dollars. He keeps walking through the maze, keeps walking through the maze, but he can't, he can't find his way out. And eventually he starts screaming, Abba, Abba, father. It's the, it's the son of the king, not one of the, the people in his in his country, but it's his son trying to get back inside to his father. And he's screaming out his father's name and his father finally comes out to him. And then he shows him that actually it was him within all the walls. He was the one in all the walls to begin with. The walls were just illusions. The walls were just seemingly walls. Now, I don't know what that means when we're talking about people that he was in the walls, but the, the nimshal for the Baal Shem of what he's teaching us here is so many different things. But first of all, it's that we can get caught up in looking at the material as the end, the wealth, the money, whatever material experience we have is something to take and now go back home. As we spoke about last week, that the, the physical goods of the world are not the entryway into Shemayim, into Olam Haba, the world that's coming, not the entryway into something more, but they're the Elilim, right? If we don't have that pause between Kol Eloheha Mim Elilim and Vashem Shemayim Asa, they become the ends of themselves. So a person grabs onto them and then runs with them and doesn't see them as a gateway into Shemayim, into something more than that. That's the first point of the Baal Shem Tov there. The second point he has is the difference between an Eved and a Ben. The Avadim of the king are the ones who take the goods and go back home. It's the Ben, it's the child of the king who keeps going, who says, I don't want the goods. I want the king. I want my father. And he keeps going and he keeps going and he keeps going until he finds him. But then the third piece, and this is the one that I want to focus on for this context of what the Baal Shem Tov is teaching us is that the walls aren't walls that separate between a person and God. It's not that Hashem is standing on the other side of the wall and there's this wall between us and then we're standing on the other side. <clears throat> so we're us and God are on opposite sides and there's a wall between. Because I think that's how so many people relate to the world. There's us, the world is the wall, and then there's God. And somehow we're trying to get over the wall to get to God. What the Baal Shem Tov is teaching us is that the world is not a wall that separates. This wall is the revelation of God. It's within the wall that we find God. 
once we get through the inside, we can look back on it now and see that the whole thing was a manifestation of godliness that took the form of these walls. So again, the physical world is a, is a physical version of spirituality. And the maze is not something that actually is meant to distract us. But what the king is teaching here, what the Baal Shem Tov is teaching us from this mushal of the king teaching his son, is that you actually didn't even need to get to the inside to find God because God was revealed already through all these walls at every single stage of the maze. So there's a lot, a lot more to say about that, but I want to, I want to kind of close with, with two other pieces. So, well, for the sake of time, I'm actually going to leave one of them. I, I encourage you to look at Rabbi Nachman in uh, Lekute Moran Kuf Chav Tes in uh, the Torah called Eretz Ochelas Yoshva. I think it's pretty, uh, pretty amazing and very apropos to this concept we're talking about. Uh, but what I want to read for you is, uh, is, is a different, is something else. Uh, in Tehillim, in Tehillim, Parakuf Lamites, what David Amelech writes is just such a perfect way of bringing this all together. And, you know, embarrassingly, I'm not holding in Tehillim. I came to this because Rabbi Nachman quotes a Pasuk in Tehillim. In the, when he quotes the Pasuk to Suchini Bivet and Imi, that I mentioned before. <clears throat> so I was looking at this parak when I was looking up where that pasuk that Rabbi Nachman quotes of Tesuchini Bevet and Imi, I started looking at this parak and I was just amazed. I mean, this parak is just unbelievable. Like just, I mean, it's just n- n- no deep perushim, but just actually learning the words of, of David Amelach in, in Kuf Lamites and Tehillim. It's just incredible. So I'm just going to read it to you. Lam Natseach David Mizmar, right? So this is uh, for the, as they translate it, for the conductor by David, a psalm. Hashem chakartani vateda. Hashem, you've investigated me. You've looked into me, vateda, and you know. You know me. Ataya data shifti vakumi. You know my sitting and you know my standing. Banta lereya meirachok. From afar, you understand my thoughts. Archi virivi zerisa. The path that I've traveled and the place that I lie down, you encompass. All of it, wherever I've been, my standing, my sitting, where I travel, where I dwell, the whole drachai hiskanta, all my ways you're familiar with. You envelop, you encase all my ways. Ki ein mila bilshoni, there's not yet a word on my tongue, meaning I haven't even spoken yet. Hein Hashem yadata kula, and you already know it. Achor vakedem sartani, you know me from behind and you know me from the front. Yadata, uh, excuse me, Vatoshas Alai Kapecha, and you've laid your hand upon me. Plia das mimeni. Niskava lo uchala, right? Knowledge that, that is a plea from me, that is that is beyond me, that's concealed from me. I'm incapable of knowing. Ana elech meruchecha, where can I go that I would escape you, your spirit? The ana mi panecha evrach. Where from your panecha, from your presence, from your face, can I run away? Im esak shamayim shamata, if I ascend, famous Chabad song, if I ascend to shamayim, I find you there. Va'itza sha'ol hineka, and if I lie down in my bed in the lowest of depths, somehow you're there too. Esa kanfei shachar, if I wake up on the wings of the morning, of dawn, eshkana ba'achris yam, if I dwell in the distant places of, of Yam, of the West or of the sea. Gam sham yadcha tanchini. And your right hand, meaning your love, your kindness will grasp me. The Omar, and then maybe I'll say, oh, but the one place I can't find you. Ach choshech yeshufeni. But darkness will, sh- will be a shadow to me. The Laila or ba'adeni. But still night will be illuminated. Because gam choshech lo yashchech mimeka, because even darkness, when it comes to Hashem, isn't darkness. The laila kayom yair, night shines like the day, kechashecha kaora, the darkness is light, which I hope rings a bell for what we've been talking about. Darkness is light, right? It's the light of darkness. Ki ata kanisa chilyosai, you have created my mind. 
It's not just that you know my mind. It's not just that we have a vessel and Hashem is coming in from without. We are within Hashem. I'm enclosed, I'm enwrapped, I'm enveloped in the womb of Imi, of my mother, of Hashem. And so we can keep going, but I, I, I hope that you can see in these psukim literally everything we've been talking about. Right, this concept that it's all light. Wherever we turn, whatever we're facing, it's all, we can sit down, we can stand up, we can stay put, we can go to a far off place. It can be daytime, it can be nighttime meaning figuratively speaking, of course, right? We can be anywhere, whatever is going on. If we go up to Shamayim, Sham Atta, if we go, Aitza Sha'ol Hineka, wherever, we, we, wherever it is that we turn, it's just more light. Different forms of light, different forms of the manifestation of godliness. Eno Mavado Mamish, because all of it exists, not that I have the world and then God comes into it, but it's all within God. It's from the, from the inside. So I want to end as usual with a, a, a short poem and then uh, maybe time for a couple of questions. So the poem is called See Through Walls. So here goes nothing. <laughs> See Through Walls. From within, around us, light, light everywhere. Only light, dark light, bright light, Simple light, big light, small light, invisible light, blinding light, warming light, food light, people light, thought light, song light, Torah light, flowers light, books light, fear light, sad light, happy light, pain light, joy light, so much light, light shining through all the walls, eating us alive, eaten, eaten, E-A-T-E-N, becoming eater. Light we become. The last two lines there was because I was expecting to go through Rabbi Nachman's Torah about Eretz Ochel Yoshva. So if you want to appreciate what I was alluding to in, in eating us alive, eaten, becoming eater, you have to learn Rabbi Nachman Kuflamites. I invite you to, uh, to check out his amazing, amazing Torah, Eretz Ochel Yoshva. So thank you all so much for, uh, for joining for this uh, five-part uh, series. And uh, hopefully we'll have opportunities at future in future ways, in whatever capacity, to cross paths again um, and, and learn more together. Um, we have time for a couple of questions. And also, someone asked me um, for a contact in case anybody wants to reach out with any questions or, or anything like that in the future. So my email is ydaniszewski at gmail.com, the letter Y, my last name, D-A-N-I-S-H-E-F-S-K-Y at gmail.com would be more than happy to hear from anybody. Um, so uh, aim. I see my mother put up a question, so I'll use that, for, I'll answer that first. Um, so good question, huh, I have to say that. No, but good question, why <laughs> does the mashal use, use walls for, uh, why does he use walls for the mashal if walls typically would be something that you would, you would use as an imagery uh, to depict dividers? So I think that's actually exactly the point because what he's saying is that even the thing that appears most divisive is really actually an illusion. It's not divisive. It's bringing us closer. Even the walls, meaning he's saying, oh, it wouldn't be a chiddish to say that the, the, the entryway that says welcome, to say that that's welcoming, that's not a chiddish, right? It's the, 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 the very clear, you know, um, whatever it is, you know, the, 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 the welcoming room, right? Um, that, you know, or, or a couch, right? Which seems so inviting, right? That would, what the Baal Shem Tov is saying is even walls, even the experiences in this world that seem like walls, that seem like dividers, because exactly what you're saying, because walls are the imagery of dividers, the things in our lives that we experience as being dividers between us and God. Even in those experiences, it's not us on one side and God on the other, and there's a wall between. In, in, in mysterious ways, the walls are also manifestations of God. The king somehow used these magicians to create walls which manifest his presence. Again, in the, nimsh in the mush, I don't know what that means. But in the nimshal, what it means is that God in his spiritual nature becomes manifest in the physical world in things that sometimes appear like walls. But it's still, it's a manifestation of spirituality. Yeah, Ami. 
Yeah, well, you're saying about the Shavisi Hashem, I was thinking about the idea of the Ishbitzer and the Sargora bring, bring that same idea. Are you familiar with those two ideas? The, the Ishbitzer and what was that? On the Pusik Shavisi Hashem, like so much of the Baal Are you familiar with this idea? I'm not, not offhand, no. Do you want to share? He it? says those, those ideas uh, seem against you, or they're there for a purpose to help you. Shavisi Hashem mm-hmm. is in order to help you. It's not, they're not, you know, the opposite. And the Sargora also brings this. And um, I think that Kofi Test is one of my favorite psukim in, uh, when I went through to Helen. Awesome. Beautiful. Yeah. That may, and, yeah um, uh, sorry, I also the t- and also the Marshall about the Boston I think I remember when I was reading um, uh, Rabbi Reichman's book, he brought the idea about that. I think the walls are seven days of creation and uh, he brings that. Somewhere. I don't yeah, know if that's there's, there's, a lot more, there's a lot more details to the Marshall, right? The, the, yeah, the Marshall is very, uh, very detailed. There's a lot more to it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But that makes sense. Right, and the seven days of creation represent nature, I meaning they represent the, the 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 idea there, figuratively speaking, is is the is that there is a nature means there's an experience of something that seems to run on its own. Again, going back to the idea of the wall, it's it's a wall between us and God because what do you mean? I don't need God. It's it's nature. It just it runs on its own. It's a self perpetuating cycle. And so what the Baal Shem Tov is teaching is even in the walls, even in the nature even in the seven days of creation, it too is a manifestation of godliness. And it's not just that God is coming into it, but it is godliness. Yeah, great. Uh, for Rabbi Akbar. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Rabbi, thank you so much. Uh, thank you for you, Rabbi Yaakov, and for uh, Rabbi Yaakov Klein for everything's uh, really amazing. Um, uh, first of all, I want to say, obviously, I went to the wrong college. Uh, <laughs> if they took now classes in the Baal Shem, then uh, a little different than earth science and things like that. Uh, but like you said, in the shirt to all Shem, so I guess I did go to the right college at the end of the day. Um, and I just want to say it's been a, a real tour de force and uh, there's such fundamental concepts uh, of Yiddishkeit in life. And uh, I really, really, I can't thank you much uh, enough, you know, and won't be sufficiently grateful for you and, and, and Yaakov. <laughs> Um, for giving, providing this. And um, I really just had two uh, questions. I think they're two separate questions, really. Um, one, I just read in Reb Dessa not so long ago that he said when Yaakov Avina was bowing to Esau, he was really bowing to Hashem. And then also recently, um, when he embraced uh, Yosef at Sadek, he, he was he was, at the same time, I guess Yosef was crying, Yaakov Vino was saying Shema, I'm pretty sure, because he wanted to connect up to Hashem. I think Rabbi Dessa says that to that extent. There's that. Um, it's a question on that in terms of what you said about just maybe just I'm um, interacting with someone. I don't have to think, oh, it's really Hashem. It's, you know, but no, I'm act- interacting with that person. And the second thing is that um, it, it's challenging to, to – it seems like there's a certain idea of kavanas, you know, intentions, you know, you know, you, you, uh, you, you know all these kind of you, – you, you know, all these different things um, – so I have, I struggle with like Gemara. I mean, you know, it's, it's the nuts and bolts of Yiddish Kite. And I struggle very much with just, I don't know, thinking like connecting up to Shem when I'm, you know, buying rubber or talking about a, you know, a cow and is it, you know, is it mood? Is it not, mood? you know, like things like that. Just, I don't know if you'd be able to speak to any of that. I, I know it's a bit much, but I appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, no, no. Said. I mean, you know, for what I can do with the, with this time in this context, but so in terms of the first question about um, the Dessler and, and also the 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 Chazal about uh, Yaakov, you know, saying Shema when he reunited with Yosef. I think that's actually exactly the point, um, because they, uh, the way that I would understand it is that it's through those experiences, within those experiences, that they were experiencing Hashem. So, uh, say it this way: there's a, there's a uh, a story they say from the Baal Shem Tov that uh, I can't remember. I apologize. I can't remember where I originally came across this, but they say that <clears throat> when he, he that he said about himself. That it used to be that when he was davening, uh, he on Friday night when he finished davening on Friday night, he was so it, so elevated that he couldn't talk to people, couldn't talk to anybody. And then he said he worked on himself, and then he got to a level even higher after working on himself, where when he finished davening, he was so elevated that the only thing he wanted to do is talk to people. Right. So when I said before that, you know, when you're talking to someone, you don't have to be to connect to 
Hashem, you don't have to be thinking about Hashem and not, and, and like talking to the person, but really in my head, I'm thinking about Hashem. What I meant by that is that not that you don't think of Hashem, but it's that through that person, that's how you access Hashem because that person is also a manifestation of godliness. So it's both going back to last week's it's, it's hard to articulate this and it's very hard to do this. It's extremely difficult, but it's, 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 uh, it, th this is what last week was about, right? That concept of using the mashal of the gift and the gift giver, right? You need to appreciate the gift that you're being given. You need to be present with the gift. But then when you're present with the gift, it itself is the access point to the relationship that the gift is being given within. So it's through the experiences within this world that we also access that which is emanating this world, but through them specifically, because God as God is unknowable to us. God is knowable through his manifestation, which is this world. So experientially, I think that takes a lot of meditative experimentation <laughs> to, to find how to exactly how to do that. Um, but it's a journey to, to try out. Um, I, would, I, would, I would encourage you to start with food. I think it's very hard to, to start doing that with people. I think you can, um, but I would, I, would, uh, I would start doing that with food. Finding a way to eat by yourself without other people, something that has a lot of taste, slowly, not when you're like starving with hunger, but savor the taste and notice that there's a feeling of something more in this taste than material food. There's a feeling that there's something present more than that. When I used to hang out by your Vitra Meyer Morgenstern, I always noticed that um, when he was, it was amazing because I mean, his face literally looks like an angel. Like it's not, it's not humanly normal uh, all the time. But then when he's davening, it's like lit up when he's learning, it's lit up. But actually in my experience, the time that his face is radiating. And when I say radiating or shining, I mean that actually very literally. <laughs> um, the time that his face is, is, is radiating and shining the most is when he's eating. It's like really, really cool. So, I mean, there's, there's a million ways to do this. Nature, people, music, art. I mean, every, literally everything, right? That's, that's the point, literally everything. Um, but I think that food is a really good starting point. Beautiful. In terms wow. of Gemara, in terms of Gemara, I think we have to wrap up. But, um, you know, first of all, I would say, <clears throat> I mean, I think it's, you know, important to have a personal Rebbe to, to speak to, you know, individually for things like this. But, you know, I want to be careful. Like, on, on the one hand, what I want to say is that, um, yes, on one level, Gemara is the nuts and bolts of Yiddish Kaip, but on another level, it's also not. Like, Chumash and Davening and Halacha are the nuts and bolts of Yiddishkeit. So somebody can't learn Gemara. It doesn't mean they're not, they're, it doesn't mean they can't, they, that they're puzzle. You know, it's not, not, not necessarily everybody can cut it in that way, 100%. And that's, that's okay. Uh, different people have different avodas. Um, I don't know how we judge if somebody who says, you know, Tehillim and learns Shnai, you know, how many people who are doing Daf Yomi aren't learning Shnai Mikra? No, I don't, I, I personally am, you know, I should, I invalidate myself on both accounts. So I'm not, this is not anything self-righteous on my part, but I don't know what we decide is the nuts and bolts and what's not, you know? Um, so that's, first of all, like you could just kind of, but, but secondly, I, you know, I think to keep trying and, um, and I think that actually the Balatanya addresses this. He talks about the fact that Gemara does not feel like a spiritual experience for most people because it's like about ox and, you know, whatever, um, all sorts of stuff that don't feel particularly spiritual the way that sometimes learning Chassidus might or learning Chumash might. Um, but he says that that's actually because Havayos Dabai Virava, Halacha, um, Gemara, actually comes from the highest place. And remember, the things that come from the higher places feel less spiritual. So he says that Yishakeni Minashikos Pihu, the kisses of the mouth, are Havayos Dabai Virava because they come from the highest, highest place. So it's okay that it doesn't feel spiritual. It's, it's happening. Whatever needs to be happening is happening. Right? Um, I think there's obviously lots of other thoughts on that, um, but those are my first two. Uh, some sort of balance between those two approaches, maybe.
Wow. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Uh, and oh, for uh, all of you. Everything. from uh, Shia. A comment. What was that? I had a comment from uh, Shia about the Gemara. Yeah, go ahead. I was reading in one of my books, I read off when he talks about the idea, but one of the things that I'm is the Book of Amun. I can think about the Book of a Sefer of Amuna. Just how we're like trees and planting everything. You look at the deeper essence of it. Just how they, they go through different things and uh, all different receptors have a deeper deeper in Yonim about how to connect to your eyes. It's hard to, for me, but like, I don't know for everyone to do this, but to realize there's a little bit of life lessons within the Mishnahis and the Gemara also. Yeah, mm. yeah, for sure. Well, All right. Up. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you, great one. Thank you so much. Yeah. Saka, Brooks, that's for my everything. Amazing. Thank everyone. You. Thank you. Thank you.